Hey everybody and welcome to Hell is for Children. This show is on every Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 2100 hours Central European Time. My name is Gerta Franken and this show is all about the topic of protective mothers and their children. So what's a protective mother? A protective mother tries to protect her child or children from their abusive father by many means necessary which is an uphill battle in today's global corrupt family court system that thrives on paternal entitlements. And today's guest is having some issues uh, coming in to our broadcasting room. So I'm going to start with some um, other general information that will um, help you understand why this global plight of protective mothers is happening, why there is a what we call mommy side going on um, on a global scale. So um, a protective mother, right, we know that a protective mother is trying to protect her child from the abusive father. And this is happening before, during, or after a divorce, right? She finds her abusive partner threatening to take full custody of her child or children. And in many, if not most cases, there's child abuse involved. Now, during the last 35 years or so in the United States, fathers have organized themselves in so-called fathers' rights groups. And unfortunately, many of these so-called father's rights groups have been infiltrated by abusive fathers who have concocted a judicial formula to sever the mother-child bond in an act of revenge against the mothers of their children as a way to continue to abuse and or molest their kids, to avoid paying child support, and judicially coerce the mothers to pay them child support instead, all in an act of ultimate coercive control. Now, these domestic terrorists and pedophiles have handbooks of hate in which they share their anti-mother formula of hate with each other. And in short, it is a five-step formula. And I'll start um, outlining these five steps in depth, but just to give you a short oversight of what these five steps are. Step one, the child reports abuse by the father, usually to the mother, but sometimes also to schools or only to a teacher at school or to a friend. Um, and people will then report the abuse to uh, Child Protective Services, CPS. Um, the mother is often the one uh, who reports the abuse, um, not just to CPS, can also be to the police or to the court. And what happens then is the mother is then accused of lying and labeled with um, the parental alienation syndrome. Uh, the mothers then enter the system and the financial siphoning then kicks in when the fathers start to vexatiously litigate with false allegations. And mothers then pay attorneys and evaluators and mediators and guardian ad litems uh, while they're severely traumatized and belittled, demeaned, and financially leached. In step four, the child abuse most often continues during visitation and the mothers report this again, and the mother is then accused of parental alienation syndrome again, loses custody of the kids, and is placed on supervised visitation, which usually erodes into no contact, whether that's by court order or without court order. The mother is then put in a situation where she pays child support, the father's attorney's fees, guardian ad litems, uh, supervised visitation, and most mothers are financially devastated. These protective mothers suffer severe PTSD as they do not only lose their kids, but also their homes, careers, savings, etc. And often protective mothers are jailed when they are unable to pay. And they're gagged when they're trying to blow the whistle on their cases. And they are then often isolated by their environments uh, because people don't understand the family court system. And in step five, the abusive fathers then continue to stalk, slander, and harass the mothers um, to 
cause them to become poor and isolated. And they brainwash the children to, you know, reject their mothers. Um, the aim of these fathers um, is for the moms to commit suicide. Now, this five-step scenario happens in 75% of all cases that involve abusive fathers. And in cases of child sexual abuse, the percentage actually goes up to 85%. Now, let me share you, um, uh, let me share my screen with you here to show you uh, a really good article on this topic. Uh, and this is by the author Keith Harmon Snow. <clears throat> he is an investigative journalist who has reported on uh, human rights violations in about 45 countries around the world. Um, he, um, if, if you're ever going to read an article about protective mothers and how children are judicially trafficked, this would be the article to read. Um, the U.S. family courts are sacrificing mothers and children, and um, the family courts are behind an epidemic of pedophilia and judicial abuse. What you see here, uh, screw the bitch, divorce tactics for men uh, by Dick Hart. Yes, this is how hateful it gets. This is one of the handbooks of hate uh, that the Father's Rights Movement used to um, execute their five-step formula of severing the mother-child bond. This is a federally funded racketeering scheme um, and you can read all about it here in this article. So, and you know, let's let's read a little bit of that together here. So, he says here a five-month investigation reveals an epidemic of violence and corruption facilitated by family courts in the United States. Children all over the United States are being taken from their protective mothers and delivered to abusers. Behind this epidemic of judicial abuse are organized networks involved in racketeering and corruption, channeling and disappearing billions of dollars U.S. taxpayers' money every year. Insurance companies are being defrauded by medical and mental health professionals rewarded handsomely for producing quack studies that criminalize loving mothers and protect abusive fathers. With clear evidence of racketeering and corruption, high court judges and insider lawyers use and abuse the family court system to destroy protective mothers and deliver life sentences of suffering to innocent children. Rich, poor, middle class, no child in America is safe. And this article is very long. Uh, it goes into um, several cases in depth. You can see exactly here how uh, these particular cases um, unfold, uh, which is very helpful. Um, so I recommend that you uh, take a look at this. I see that uh, Becca is in the broadcasting room. We just need to get her video turned on. So Becca, uh, you can probably hear me. Um, there you are. Hi. Hey. Hi. Well, welcome to Hells for Children. Um, I had already started introducing uh, our, you know, global plight a little bit, um, but now you're here so I can introduce you properly to um, the audience um, so they know who you are. Um, protective mother, Becca Barnes, lost custody of two children to her abusive ex due to false allegations of parental alienation, like I just explained, and despite evidence of molestation, abuse, and neglect. So welcome to Hells for Children, Becca. I'm so glad you were able to come into the uh, broadcasting room to explain your story. Um, and because it, it is perfect in the sense that it outlines exactly what I just shared with the audience and how uh, abusive fathers use the judicial system to sever uh, the bonds between mothers and children. So why don't you start um, sharing with the audience um, how your story unfolded? Well, 
the very beginning would have been when I was first married to my ex, who is now my ex-husband, in the first year of marriage, I found a story on his computer that was very detailed and how he was molesting three different girls. It was a story. I don't know that it necessarily happened at that point. But of course, that was quite disturbing. I waited a while to make sure we wanted to have children. I didn't want to have children if, you know, this was going to be an issue. It seemed like there was going to be no issue. But then November of 2009 is when I was pregnant with my first child. And when I had to bring to his attention, along with some other people, um, his cheating issues oh, against me, as soon as the other people left, he actually strangled me for a while. Um, it was quite frighten frightening just to show that he was abusive at times. And um, it was November of 2013 that I was uh, looking at his history in his iPod Touch. He knew that I looked at his history because of the issues of the cheating against me. And at this point, I found that he was using an app called IDVM, which you can look up information about TV shows, movies, different things like that. But he was using it to look information up about an HBO series, about different, different titles, some of them about adults with children, um, how women's breasts are sexual with babies. Different, it was a lot of adult with children type things very um, caught me that I knew there had to be something that had to be done at that point. Up until like for the last couple of months at least, my son at that point, he was four years old, was randomly saying, Daddy, it's that, but never said why. I just figured it was, you know, other things that he had seen going on. I didn't know that it could be something going against him. So that morning, I, I was up pretty much most of the night. When my children had gotten up, I asked my son then, I said, um, you have told me before, I said, Daddy is bad. I'm like, I need to know why you say that he is bad. And he was extremely frightened. He did not want to come out and say why. So I told him, like, Mommy is here to help you. You're not going to be in trouble for telling me whatever is going on. And then he spilled the beans. And he said the details, not only to him, but also to his sister, what his stepfather was doing to them. The, um, my girl at that point was just about to turn three. I had a meeting with my pastor at that point, along with my ex-husband. He tried to say that all things are being blown out of proportion. They don't know what they're talking about. And I never believed them. So I set some very strict rules. I said, if this happens again, that me and you are over. You will not have nothing to do with the children. So it was less than a month later. My son came to me one morning and he said, Mommy, this happened again while you were at work last night. Him and his sister both. Details of where it happened. Like, literally, he pointed right on the floor. This is exactly where it happened. This is exactly what Daddy did to us. So at that point, I knew we had to go. There was no turning back. So... I called Childline at that point, and when Children of Youth came out, it was either later that day, I think it was later, yeah, like later that day that I called them. They told me that I had to file a PFA. What's so that? A PFA is a protection against abuse disorder. Sorry. Of course, my phone would have to make noise now. <laughs> Yes, protection against abuse order. So, um, or from abuse. So I filed that like I was told to do. When we showed up in court, he had a lawyer. I kind of was surprised about that. I did not expect that. I figured you just go tell, each side tells their story to the judge, and this is pretty easy. The judge is going to see that I'm here to protect my children, that he's a liar. And, well, he had a lawyer, so he got right out of it easily. I told children and youth, I'm like, what do I do? They said, you file another one. She's like, write pretty much the same thing you did before. So I did, and they got me information about how to get a lawyer through the state um, that I would not have to pay for. When I kicked him, well, when I told him to leave, I had a full-time job at that point. By the time this was going on, I still had the job, but not enough money to surely pay for a lawyer, not even close. So... We went back then, probably about a week or two later, to court, and the PFA was issued. 
while children and youth was looking into this investigation. And at this point, we were given a good caseworker who actually cared about the children and was doing right for our family of what she was able to do. She told me to take the children to a counseling service that was free in the area and I myself could go to, so all three of us started going in January. And by the time we started going, I lost my job, but God works everything out. Right when I was losing my job, I had already filed. I was, I was told by a lawyer, file for child support, already had done that. And child support was just about to come through, so I was going to be able to pay the bills, take care of the children, and more importantly at that point, anyhow, was getting to them to these counseling sessions. We had to go at least once or twice a week. They taught them what's called like the no-go tell. Somebody tries to do something they shouldn't do to you, you tell them no. Go if you run away. Tell if you tell an adult like your mother or somebody that can help you. We did that for a couple of months and it wasn't long at all that children and youth, um, the children did not come out and tell children youth anything. The Council, one of the counselors that was working with my son said it most definitely did happen. They had called it in that it happened. And, but when they called it in, I think they called before my children came out and said anything. I think they called in by what I had told them because legally they are bound to call these things in. Now, children and youth said that first one was um, unfounded. So therefore, shortly after the PFA, was dropped because of that, and then we had to go to child custody court. I got primary custody of the children. Well, for the first month, he got one day a week where he was supervised by his mother to make sure he wasn't doing anything, and then after that, he was not. He was no longer supervised, unsupervised with, with him. It wasn't long until he was getting them overnight. Once he was getting he, he went to, I'm not sure if he was getting them overnight before the children came to me and said more graphic details, much more had happened than what was going on before, even to the point of him taking child pornography of my children. And I couldn't imagine it. I called children and youth again. This time they tell me that our first caseworker was no longer there. We're given a second caseworker. During the time of the first caseworker, I was told I had to sign papers for them to do services with our family, and, to, and she told me, um, this, this also gives us permission to take the children from you if we ever would need to, but she said there's no reason we would ever need to take the children from you. There is nothing on your part. Well, the second caseworker from day one was against me and the children, and was all for the father. So when... She called me, we set up our appointment, she comes out extremely rude to the children. She talked to me for only a little bit of time. I said, I don't think I need to go through the whole entire story before. That's the same kind of things going on. And shut down, my children are saying about the photography we've taken of them. Um, other than that, everything's the same. Like I'm like, you already have it all written down. And so... She had taken the kids upstairs to their room, and they wanted to show her toys. They wanted to get to know her before they would say anything to her. She said, you have five minutes. If you don't tell me within five minutes, I'm leaving, and that's it. Uh, just, I mean, we're talking toddlers. They're not interested. They don't understand that this person could be helping them. Once she left, which it really was only five minutes, and she left, my son said, Mommy, I like the other other one better. Why can't we have her? And I said, because she's no longer with them. There's nothing we can do about that. And he said, I would have told the other one what Daddy's doing to us, but I don't like this new one. And the new one was Jamie Stewart, who is also being sued by another mother in Lutheran County for the same type of things that she's doing to us. Another mother that has called in to protect her children from the abuse of father. She took them from that mother as well, trying to get them with the father. Now, Lucerne County um, is very well known for these types of issues, correct? Yes. Lucerne County is ranked in the top ten. I w I've been told even at times we're ranked as number one in the whole entire United States 
at being number one for the worst corruption in our family courts and children and youth. And now, you shared a link uh, as well, I believe. Um, let me pull that up here so we can share with the audience that what you're sharing is <clears throat> a pattern that's going on um, in Lucerne County. Um, I hope you can see, you all can see this. Lucerne County children and youth given third provisional license. Um, so they are getting a lot of complaints about this issue. Yes. All right. I've seen something about six to seven hundred parents have turned them in. Now, this caseworker, the second one, she also told me to file a PFA, which I did. And we had that hearing only, you know, like maybe a week or so later. And she showed up to test, she was going to testify for, for on the father's side saying that she never told me to file the PFA, even though she did. I found that very weird, for sure. Now, after that point, um, I obviously knew she was on the father's side. I could see it. But it was right around that time that I was told by my lawyer to get my children into counseling. When we went for child custody that February, they signed that, like in the court order, that we would all see a counselor together. Like the whole family would be seeing the same counselor. They gave counselors names in there, and none of them were willing to see their parents as well as the children. It was either the parents or either the children, not all together. So when I brought this issue up to the lawyer, he said, get them to this particular counselor. She's a licensed trauma therapist, well known for how well she works with children. She really cares about what's best for the children, what the truth is. So they were going there. She was working with them one-on-one every single week and spent plenty of time with them. And she told me really from the get go, she could see signs of abuse, but she had to wait until they came out and gave very graphic details. Well, then again, this is now is May of, 20, of 2014. And it was the last Friday in May, May 30th, that they came out and told her new de details of abuse that happened to them earlier that week. They had told me as well, I knew it happened. I went ahead, called into child line again. This is now the third time we had to call into child line. Once she told, once they, they told her the details, she had anatomical dolls. They showed her on anatomical dolls how bad it really was. And she called child line herself, the therapist, and told them she, um, what was going on with these children. Now, at this point, we've had at least five calls in the child line. I personally have done three. I've been told by child line I'm doing everything correctly. Um, maybe about March, I started keeping a logbook. So that was um, my lawyer told me, keep the logbook, dates, times, everything that they say, everything that I say to them so they can't use this all that I'm, you know, trying to get them to say something that shouldn't be said. It's kind of like I'm saying things like, well, when did this happen? Where did it happen? How did it happen? Things like that. Is there anything else? Um, you know, just making sure they're telling me everything that was all it was. I didn't know that everything I was told to do was going to be used against me very soon. So Jamie Stewart, um, her supervisor, got, also got a call from the licensed therapist because the licensed therapist um, was concerned that this caseworker was not trying to help these children. And so when she contacted the supervisor, she said that this caseworker is completely biased towards the father. This caseworker needs to be dropped from this family case, and we need a new caseworker. It was later that day that I was teaching a student piano lesson, and this um, all of a sudden I get this very knock on my door, and I went to answer it, and it was the police. And I've never had anything to hide. And I said, okay, you're just going to have to wait until I'm done teaching, I'm in the middle of working, this, part, the, this parent pays for the child for me to teach them, you're going to have to wait till I'm just done, and then I can talk to you, no problem. Like, I, I have no problem with that. Well, the student um, quit. I don't blame her at all. I probably would have felt the same way, a police showing at the door, 
I explained to the mother there's some issues with the father. That's why the I'm like, the police never showed up like this before. I was surprised, too. But I'm like, I'm sorry that it happened. But obviously, um, you know, she quit and never came back, and I understand. But then that was another loss of income when that happened. But this is when Jamie Stewart is with the police and proceeds to tell me that they have custody of my children after I left them inside my house. I had nothing to hide. I never had an issue before. Um, I had nothing to be scared of. I was doing everything right. Um, I was very happy, actually, that day that the children not only had told me, but now they have told a counselor. Now they tell a therapist, you know, this is all we need for court for them to prove that, oh, it's not just the mother, because I know that they could try to say that. This is a licensed therapist who's working with the children one-on-one -on -one every week that is proving this. Well, Jamie Stewart is like, yeah, we have custody of your children. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you can't have custody of my children. I'm like, just earlier today, they told their licensed therapist the way they're being abused by their father. And I didn't look at the papers in detail until after they left, but they literally ripped my daughter from my arms. She was three years old at the time. And they're, they're like, well, you know, doesn't it make you feel better that they're going to be with family? I'm like, what do you mean they're going to be with family? Yeah, we're going to put them with um, your ex's sister and her husband. I'm like, that is so wrong. I'm like, he's the, I'm like, he's the one that's being abu the abusive one, and you're going to put him with his family? I'm like, how do I know you're going to, they're going to keep him away from them? And I'm like, you can't tell me that his family is going to be sticking up for the kids. I don't believe, there's no way of proving that one. But it, it, that's just wrong in itself. But then that's called kinship foster care. I found out later on that with kinship foster care, they get even more incentives for taking from the parent than even regular foster care. There is a law out there called Title IV e funding. They got $10,000 from the federal government per child. That means $20,000 just for taking my children out of my house. Plus whatever money they get for kinship foster care. Plus the state government now matches what the federal government gives them, meaning $20,000 per child. Now we have $40,000 just for taking them out of my house. Plus the local county can also give them money for doing this as well. Then once they I left and I'm looking through the papers better, I realized that the papers were not notarized by the court, nor were they signed by the judge. Children and youth does this all the time. I was told by my lawyer, yeah, they do that all the time and they get away with it. I'm like, yeah, but you can't tell me that's legal. I'm like, any kind of court document has to be notarized and it has to be signed by the judge. It's completely illegal. I also was told that day that I had Monday morning I was to be in court. This happens late Friday afternoon. There is no lawyer available at that point in the day to talk to. So now, first thing Monday morning, I have to call my lawyer. I've literally ran, uh, ran into his office because, and I have to be like, is it last minute. He has to now try to see if he can possibly at least get to the courthouse and say, listen, nobody was expecting this. Now that they had to push the court hearing off because he has to have time to repair what else is going on. So then we're in court um, a lot of June in 2014. I testified, my ex testified, he has family members that testified on his behalf. I had the licensed therapist that testified for the children. The caseworker, Jamie Stewart, also testified. Somehow, um, neither parent got custody of the children right away, but then his lawyer appealed and we went back in. There were very little questions hardly even asked, and the judge hands over the children right to the father full custody. This is in June, when, once we were finally done and we get a court order, we are court ordered, mind you, to see a psychologist, the whole family. Not only are we court ordered to see a psychologist, her name is Dr. Lenora Finn. When you are sitting there in the courtroom, the judge looks at the caseworker and says, oh, you're going to call Dr. Lenora Finn, right, and set that up? And she says, yes. There is nothing about your own rights, about who you want to see, who you are more comfortable. When 
the judge gives the father custody of the children, nobody had been seen yet by the psychologist. We were waiting to get in. Then in September was when we started seeing the psychologist. When I walk in to the psychologist for the very first time, I'm looking down the street because I have the address. I couldn't believe it that her office was actually inside the children and youth building. When you go into her office, she proceeds to tell you that she is a third party independent of children and youth. But yet 90% or more of her work comes from children and youth. She also has um, some problems in the past with the court system. I looked those up as well. She had her license taken away from her. She has been sued by families before for malpractice. Yet children and youth, this is who they use. She right, and and the court and the court is enforcing this. Yes, the court does not give you a choice. This is the person you are to see. Then. She pretends that she doesn't know my caseworker, who has been working there for well over 10 years or more. I find out from a lawyer down the road that, oh, they go out to eat for lunch all the time. She's just lying to you. This is from the lawyer's words. He's seen them out to eat together at lunch. So she, he's like, I know that they know each other. Found out later in court also that the whole, the whole thing is biased that the caseworker talks to the psychologist, tells her pretty much what she wants to be done. She tells her her side of the story, this is what we have right now, and then the psychologist goes from there. The psychologist did not have anything of why I could not have my children. She just mentioned, she believed that I had OCD and a verbal learning disability, which is ridiculous. I was an AB student all through high school. Um, I was on the honor roll quite a bit. I, I, I'm, in the, I'm a, not only am I a pianist, I can literally play anything you could imagine. I do not have no verbal learning disability, nor do I have OCD out there. I mean, I'm a perfectionist in ways, but not the OCD that, like, a psychological problem. I don't have that. Well, even if you had OCD, that's not a reason to remove your children and place no. them with an identified pedophile. <laughs> no, not at all. And... Once they gave him full custody, even before then, I was only allowed supervised visitation at the Children and Youth Building. That's all that ever happened. And in this paperwork, when they take the children from me, it literally says they took the children from me for calling into child line multiple times. So they claim that I'm mentally unstable. They used the whole that I filed multiple PFAs against the father, which I was told to do by Children and Youth. They used that against me. They use it against me that I took the children to do all, all the testing that they asked for them to do. Um, they take them to a center. They ask them questions and things. Everything. They say, they say that I'm the one traumatizing the children by turning in the pedophile. So therefore now the, the children, I mean, would literally scream. They did not want to see him at all. Uh, every time the PFA was dropped, they were crying. They did not want to go back and see him. And I'm like, I'm doing everything I can. There's nothing I can do. The one morning, my son literally looked at me and he said, Mommy, can't we send Daddy to hell? And I said, No, that's not our job to do that. That's up to God. But Mommy is fighting for you. And I'm going to see if we can possibly get Daddy at least in trouble here. Um, so for the rest of 2014, with supervised visitation at Children and Youth. In December of 2014 is when we have the court hearing that we can get Children and Youth closed out of the case, so to say. But the caseworker demands that I still have supervised visitation. Her reasoning was that she does not think that I'm a, a mother that should be with my children. And the judge, at, the master, actually was the master that asked her why. And she said, well, because Kira had a bruise on her one day. And the mother questioned her why she had the bruise on her. So therefore, she can't. She needs to be supervised. Supervised visitation has been put in place, is a law that's put in place for parents that are either abusive or neglected to their children. That they don't even have 
any anything on me to say that I've been abusive or neglected to my children at all. I am a piano teacher. I have all of my clearances. I have the FBI fingerprints. I have the child abuse clearance forms. I have the PA state police clearance forms. I've cleared everything. No problems at all. I've never done anything against the child. Um, if somebody was to ask any of my piano students how I treat them, they would be able to tell you very well that I would never harm them in any way, shape, or form. And some of them are the same age as my children. Now, when that court hearing, by the time we were done there, I find out they give me two supervisors that I can use, a couple of names. I'm talking to my lawyer, trying to get everything set in place. By the time you get somebody that is able to do this, you're waiting. I get a couple, at least three weeks before I get to see my children. And this is literally right over Christmas time. I did not get to have any type of Christmas with my children, let alone even see them in 2014. And I had set up multiple appointments with one of the um, supervisors. The father refused to bring them. This is something we had to pay cash money for me to see the children. This lady would have been $80 an hour. Um, my lawyer had found her. And then we had to find someone else because he refused to bring them. And he finally agreed to somebody else. And this lady charged $35 an hour to see her children. Not quite as bad. And now since we're um, also, this has been down to two hours now. It was four hours that I got to see my children. They also put this one down to two hours. And... By the time that lady worked things out that we were able to get things set up and he actually brought us and we were probably in like the third week of January. I haven't seen my children now like a month. She only does two or three visits at the most. She's like um, very scared about any type, type of snowy weather whatsoever. I live up on a mountain. So that was kind of her excuse that she couldn't do it. Once she said she couldn't do it, there I am out again, trying to find another person who can do supervised visitation. Now, I am must have waited probably a good two to three months by the time we get somebody else that we can find that he agrees to, to bring them. This person is $50 an hour. Mind you, all three of these people are cash money only. They will not accept any other form of payment besides cash money. This keeps on going on. That lady um, only did the supervised visitation for maybe about two months. My ex tells her that he does not want me changing the children's clothes at all. Like, he doesn't have the right to say what we can and cannot do. Um, in the time that I have with the children, I had talked to my lawyer about this. My lawyer said there is no issue with a parent changing the children's clothes, as long as it's not every single week, which it had not been. We were sitting in the mall. This particular supervisor also made us do visits out in the mall, like in the public area. So you're not really getting the time with your kids, like quality time, because now you're out in a public area um, trying to find something that everybody can do together kind of thing. So we're sitting there the one day, and my daughter sees clothes were in the bag. I did keep clothes in the bag, kind of like just in case if we needed them. It wasn't like I was planning on changing them. She said, oh, mommy, is that for me? That's my favorite color pink. And I said, yeah, you know, that's no problem. And that's when this lady is like, no, you can't change their clothes. And I'm like, my lawyer has already talked to you. I am allowed to change their clothes. And as far as it goes, they change their own clothes. But they're at a point now, you know, especially my son, he's the one that's older. He changes his own clothes. So me and her had a little bit of an argument. I'm like, you can't tell me that my children can't change their clothes. This is against my parental rights of them. And my lawyer already even spoke to you about this. Just because it's what the father wants doesn't mean it's what you do. You're being paid by both of us for me to see these children. Go into the bathroom a little bit later. My children literally sit down on the floor and take their shoes off. Not their clothes, their shoes. She ends the visit right then and there. And I said, I'm sorry, but this is not their clothes. They obviously wanted to change to more comfortable shoes. She's like, well, you should have stopped them. And I'm like, no, you said clothes. This is shoes. This is different. She ends the visit on us. And I told her, I'm like, 
And now they use this against me on court. I told her, I'm like, the only reason we're even here is because of what their father has done against them. Like, we're not even supposed to be here. I'm like, you're going to make such a big issue that my children want to change their shoes after you said they can't change their clothes. I'm like, that's different. I already paid her. She she also made us pay her before the visit actually started. So now we both already paid her. I saw the kids for a total of like a half hour that day. There was a full hour that was paid for that she just kept the money. She refused to give the money back. At that point, she refused to do anything with our family. This is May of 2015. Last time I've seen my children for quite some time. I'm trying to find somebody else to do it. Um, probably a good three months. A good three months before um, the original supervisor that was coming to my house would come again. She was fine now. Now the weather's better, so now she comes again for a while, and we do some supervised visitation. Then it would come to a point to where I don't know if it was too much on her or what, but. Now, um, I see my kids, and mind you, I'm supposed to see them every single week, and there are many, many excuses and why he does not bring the children. Tons occur. Um, probably I saw them about two, maybe two out of every three weeks for two hours. That's it. And there was, at least once every three weeks he has something going on, he does not bring the children. Now, January of 2016, there is a court hearing now. And this last supervisor, the one that I originally did earlier, she says in court that I still need to have supervised visitation because they overfeed my children. That was her take on it. As you can see, every time we go to court, they're changing their mind and why I have to have supervised visitation. None of this is legal. Um, how many children do you see at their weight? For one thing, my children are extremely skinny. They're not overweight. I give them their food on a kid-sized plate, and I do not overfeed them by any means. And there are times that my son would have seconds. My daughter and my ex-husband will say the same thing. My daughter, sometimes you just kind of have to sit there and collect her to eat until she actually eats. It takes time with her sometimes. So at this point, um, I've seen this happen before. Every time we went to court, I start realizing that it's done behind closed doors. Our cases, anybody that I, anybody that could possibly know me is not allowed in the courtroom at all. January 2016, I have two people there to wit or like witnesses for me to testify for me. My ex has the caseworker and the super supervisors to be like witness for him. They have somehow I'm supposed to go first and they say, well, let's take his first. So they take his first. All of his testify. Once they testified, find out from the master that was doing the hearing that day, my witnesses were forced to sit in another room, not allowed in the courtroom at all, while his witnesses were allowed in there the whole time, literally going off of what one another one says. Well, that one said that, and I agree with them. That's not even allowed. They have to come up with their own story and what they have to say. So now he refuses to bring in my witnesses that are there. I also have, by this time, I've gotten my own psychological evaluation that proves there is nothing psychologically wrong with me whatsoever. I don't have the OCD that, this other, that Dr. Lenore Finn claims that I have. I don't have a verbal learning disability. There's no reason I can't have my children. This master literally refuses the report from my psychologist, literally refuses to speak to him on the phone like we were supposed to do. It was like I'm in there and I'm against up a herd of lions attacking me. Because then they, they want me to testify and just so they can try to tear me apart, which doesn't work too well because I stand my ground very well. But the only thing that came out of that hearing, his lawyer got every single thing that they asked for. My lawyer was literally told to shut up and sit down. And the order when we get it, 
I'm trying to see my kids. Now it says I cannot even see my children for 30 days. No contact. All because this one supervisor claims that I overfeed my children, which I don't. Um, from what I know, she doesn't even have any children of her own either. She wouldn't know how much a child should seriously eat. For her to make that decision, she would have to be like a pediatrician. She's not no pediatrician. <laughs> she doesn't have any licensing that would qualify her, or education either, that would qualify for making this decision. Yes, they allow them to make these decisions. Now at this point, 30 days goes by. In the meantime, I'm trying to get somebody to supervise the visits again. I go back to the two that we have used before. Um, the one that had been doing it says, well, I don't see it. Um, she's like, I'm looking through the court order, and it just isn't clear enough to me that I should be doing this. And the other one is doesn't want to work with our family. So here I am going months without seeing my children again. I'm talking to my lawyer. That in itself to fight, figure out that those two supervisors are not going to come back and do any super type of supervising for our family. That took literally months to even figure that part out. Now we have to start looking elsewhere. My psychologist says that he is willing to do the supervised visitation. I would not have to pay him as much as I have to pay these other people. It would be a little cheaper. My ex refuses him. I'm still looking for someone else to talk to my lawyer. cannot find anyone else to do this at this point. Um, I went literally 10 months without seeing my children. Um, they had no good reason trying to uh, trying to get my lawyer to appeal the decision when she wrote a repeal out uh, and appeal out. The court system somehow lost the whole order that my lawyer had appealed. They couldn't how find it anywhere. How convenient, right? How convenient. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Very odd. We, my uh, lawyer appealed this whole order in February, um, should have been in there no later than March uh, to go over the appeal in court. They never scheduled a date at all. I finally found a different lawyer because that lawyer, as much as I said, listen, I'm like, you have to get on them and, you know, we have to get into court. Um, he's kind of coming up with excuses and I'm like, listen, I'm like, well, we're not, I'm not getting back in court this way. I'm never going to get to see my children. I'm like, that's what's happening. So I found this other lawyer that um, seemed to be a little more aggressive and maybe a little more understanding of these situations. He has fought against Luther and County Children Youth multiple times. He knows how they work. And he starts on it. He's calling them pretty often. He said he literally had to call every single court office at least twice and eventually talk to the judge's secretary for the second time. Well, you know, one says, well, it's not our fault. You need to talk to this office. It's not our, every office he talks to says, well, it's not our fault. You need to talk to this office. And giving him, like, the circus here. Once he finally talks to the judge's secretary for the second time, he said, listen, this is all I've heard from everybody else. It's not your fault. And you have to talk to someone else. He said, we have to get in the court. This mother is not allowed to see your children. They have no reason for this. That, he tried to get us in the court. He started working on that in May. That was finally scheduled in, like, July, and then got pushed off. We didn't actually get into court until the end of August. By the time it was pushed off, we like, twice, two different times. They pushed different people, pushed it off. End of August, we finally get into court. Now, finally, the court, like, says, yes, yeah, she's supposed to be having a supervised visit, court-ordered. But I had somebody come with me to court that day that could do the supervised visitation. And so we were able to get her approved. But his side demanded, literally demanded, that I have to have at least one more supervised visita visitation with this person. I have to pay $50 an hour to. And at this point, I'm told that I have to pay for all of it before it was split between the parents. Now all of a sudden I have to pay for all of it. So we had our one last visit with her, and she even said that it went well. There was a report given. Now it takes a good three weeks or more from the time that I see my, my children that time, and that was the first time I seen them in 10 months, to get my ex-husband to agree to this person that was already agreed on in court 
We're already told by court that she's the one to do this, but he decides that he has to agree. He has to have a meeting with her. He has to approve of her. This is what's court ordered, yet he can do literally anything he wants. And finally, after like three weeks of like, listen, I'm supposed to be seeing my kids here. Finally, he approves her. She's doing the visit. And since then, I've been seeing the children a little more frequently, but it's still all supervised. I was at court again a couple weeks ago. And at this point, I'm finally, after all this time, getting four hours of time with my children instead of two. All has to be supervised. And they still have no good reason for any of it. There's no no, um, no signs at all of abuse or neglect. They haven't even accused me of any abuse or neglect in any way, shape, or form. Yet I still have to have supervised visitation with my children. Um, I talked to my ex outside of court. He will say one thing and he does another. That's how it always has been. He kind of said that at this point he thinks that the children want to be with me more and they never really wanted to be with him. I don't know what their feelings on that are at this point because they've been stuck with him for so long. But I do know that they keep on telling me that they want to be with me more. And as much as I try to talk to him outside the court, he still is refusing even to go with that. Um, he's, I should say he's refusing to agree to me having unsupervised visitation, even you know if it was a whole day a week to have my children. This last court hearing, as always, um, his lawyer literally gets everything he wants. There's no questions asked. Whatever his lawyer wants, they get. And his lawyer now is has decided that I need a psychiatric evaluation after I've already had two, two psychological evaluations, stating that there is nothing wrong with me psychologically. And even my ex thinks he said that he's not really for it because then we have both have to put out a lot of money for this a lot of money and um, I work at McDonald's I now a manager I, I started there as a crew person to kind of work my way up to the manager but I don't get paid to be a manager if that makes sense I'm still getting paid through rate um, and then I also get some piano lessons on the side as well they took me for child support back last April we went into and into court over child support when I was only working McDonald's and I had like two piano students at that time with very little income legally for the state of Pennsylvania they cannot bring your net income below nine hundred and twenty dollars that's legally speaking I knew this going in I researched it I told the judge that she was like I don't care she said if you don't sign these papers today I'm gonna take even more from you they're taking like $300 of child support from me, bringing my um, income down to about $700 a month at that time. Um, I picked up a few more students, so um, it's not quite that bad now. The whole thing is illegal. I talked to my... Uh, what's, what's the name of this judge? <clears throat> of which judge? The judge that's, uh, that said, I don't care about the regulations and I'm ordering you this child support. I don't have that was a master that's the master that does all like you she's kind of like the top one and I don't have it with me at the moment because when somebody's house doing this it's my internet's no good at my house I don't remember her name off top, top of my head I guess I could have had the information with me I don't but Judge Jennifer Lynn Rogers is the one that does all of the normal court hearings and I have found out from somebody that she was the attorney for children and youth for over 10 years. So in some cases that might be a good thing when children and youth are actually sticking up for the children, doing what's right for the children. But in my case as well as many other cases, we have a caseworker who does not give a care about what's going on with the children. All they care about is the incentives for taking them from the mother and putting them with the father. They're also with more money that they get for putting them with the father too. There's so many ridiculous laws out there that it's just out really against the mothers, no matter what they do for these children and all for the fathers, no matter if, I mean, some fathers do need that time with their children if they're a decent father and they're doing things right. But if they're being abusive and you've been able to prove that they're abusive, they shouldn't be getting their children. 
Well, I let also, me share my screen here and show the audience the uh, father's rights funding, that, uh, uh, that Title IV funding that you were talking about. Yeah. If you go to this website, macabuse.org, and, and click on the research button here, it'll bring you to um, a huge amount of PDFs that evidence exactly what you're saying that all these organizations um, are making so much money off of what they're doing to you and your children. Placing the children with the abusive fathers is, um, you know, granting all these programs money. It is, this is not about children, it is all about money. And it goes into real extremes. Um, you know, a great book on this is called Motherless America by Doreen Ludwig. Um, you know, I advise anyone to read this. I mean, these, first of all, fatherhood funding needs to be abolished because it's discriminatory. Why are we going to be funding fathers and not mothers? If you're going to fund fathers, then also fund the mothers. So how about just abolishing all this funding and uh, let's take a look at, um, you know, where this funding is going and how it's used. We need a huge audit on this money and where it's going um, because the judicial child trafficking that's going on is generating $800 billion a year in the United States alone. Um, it is a $3 trillion a year um, you know, pro-abuse revenue system that's on a global scale at this point. And that's uh, what you're caught up in. So I'll go on. Okay. Yeah, so the last time we were in court, yeah, I'm still seeing my kids, but, you know, still supervised. His lawyer is saying I have to have the psychiatric evaluation. Even my ex agrees that we don't need to do this. This is a waste of time and money. I talked to my psychologist, who also testified in court last time, too. Um, he kind of felt like, though, the, you know, they need the answers right away. He's trying to go through my file. I'm just one of many patients that he sees. He's not going to know the information right off the top of his head. And so he said, um, you know, he, he, he thinks the best, best route to go now is for him to write a report. So I'm hoping that we can get this done. And seeing if you know the judge will look at this, but with how biased the judge is towards whatever children and youth has wanted, whatever my ex's lawyer has wanted, it's probably not likely. They're probably going to just keep on like it has been for years now, coming up with the craziest things, saying that I have to be supervised with my children. And um, at this point, I've asked my lawyer multiple times because of. As we can see, Luzerne County Children and Youth has lost their provisional license three times in a row. And I've asked him to at least file a lawsuit against them, trying to get some things turned around. It's not happened. At this point, we could file criminal charges against the caseworker. I contacted the district attorney's office uh, when they first picked my children from me. And... She said, oh, you're the mother that Jamie Stewart just took the children from. I mean, yeah, yes. And part of the problem with the district attorney's office is they will only allow you to talk to, like, one person, and that would be the person that was dealing with Jamie Stewart and has heard whatever she has come up with. And she said, oh, well, I don't need to believe you then. She And I'm like, do you realize that this father has taken – a lot of child pornography of my children. I'm like, not only did they tell me this, they also told their licensed trauma therapist about this as well. And some details about this. I have a lot of details of it. And she said, I don't care what you have to say. Um, if the license, if this licensed therapist wants to call me, I'll talk to her, but she had no interest in helping these children. This should have been so easy for them to put out a warrant to have gone in, get this child pornography, proven this all. It would have been so easy, but yet they never did it. They just let the children suffer because all they care about is the money. You have, you have expert evidence of child molestation. Yes. You have your children who have disclosed about molestation. 
So the father, in a normal <laughs> justice system, the father should be in jail. Yeah. And um, if I was the judge on your case, I wouldn't even allow supervised visitation for the father. Right. But here you are in the complete opposite um, situation. And from what I'm getting from your story is this um, the CPS system that you're in is running the entire show. Yes. The therapists, the supervisors, they're linked with the judge. I mean, this is there's clear evidence of collusion going on here, which is something that um, you could use in a case. Let's take a look at... You know, your attorney is not the only one doing this. Um, I'm sorry, your judge is not the only one that's doing this. On my timeline here, I have this um, about an hour-long video of Judge Edelman in Connecticut, who literally, if you listen to this, it's really shocking. Um, he's here in a, a committee in front of the Judicial uh, Committee because of complaints, just like mothers like you who complain about this judge. And he literally says, um, I don't like these mothers crying when I cut off all the contact between them and their children. And because they're so emotional, um, I don't want them to have any contact with their kids. And, you know, he gets confronted about the fact, how, you know, that his, his, his hatred towards women, you know, is threatening uh, threatening women, using children as weapons. And you would think that after this hearing, this man would never be allowed to be a judge again, but no, he has been appointed in another county, and he's doing the same thing somewhere else in another county now to other protective mothers. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is that because people, when they're watching this show, I want them to realize that this is happening at a global scale. And it's wonderful to see a judge like this actually blatantly um, stating this stuff and then even complaining about his difficult job. I mean, these people are out of control and we need to have these folks uh, appear at a human rights tribunal for their human rights violations. That is what I'm going to be suggesting um, right here on the show. As far as the, um, the lying, horrific social worker that you're dealing with, um, take a look at this uh, YouTube video by Sean McMillan nuts and bolts of filing civil rights claims and it's geared towards exactly it's geared towards going after um, CPS workers so um, this man this attorney is the absolute hero um, attorney of victims like you and he has helped uh, for example, this mom, um, let me see if it will load, Deanna Fogarty Hardwick um, and sued the Orange County, California caseworkers on her case and um, got her $9.6 million uh, awarded. Now, he didn't stop there. Once her daughter was um, an adult once she became 18 years old. Um, he also helped a daughter file um, a case <clears throat> against the same social workers and got her a bunch of mom uh, money too. So these are things that we can do. We need to learn from Sean McMillan. He does workshops uh, all over the place. We need to get him technically set up so we can actually do webinars and whatnot uh, and broadcast his workshops um, nationally because you know we need to go after these horrific, um, you know, I can't even call them people. I mean, what, what is this? Children are just being seen as resources. Uh, that's all it is. It's exactly what you're saying. There's no, um, this is not about children. This is not about humans anymore. It's about just what money uh, they can create um, by placing the children with the most abusive uh, parent, which is usually the father. Um, not to say that it doesn't happen uh, in reverse, but 
uh, what research has shown is that 82% of um, abusive fathers get full custody. Um, and let me pull up some research here to evidence that, because it's important that people understand that these are not just figures that were thrown around. This is, this is all evidenced by academic research. If you go to my page here, uh, freejasmine.com, the spelling of her Dutch name, you go on to the reflection um, page. I have outlined all of this here and why this is happening and how this is happening. And um, it is a federally funded father's rights pro-abuse industry. Um, and these children are judicially sex trafficked by the millions. I mean, it is outrageous. This is out of control. And like you, most protective mothers are completely financially destroyed. Um, if they can't pay the supervisors, the child support, the father's attorney's fees, um, some of them get incarcerated. Um, you know, this is extremely traumatizing. And of course, there's a reason for, for that, right? I mean, if you, if you traumatize a mother, um, she's not going to be able to fight back efficiently because here you are dealing with the enormous grief of not being able to protect your children against the abuser and you're missing them on top of, of that and you're dealing with supervisors that make up nonsense in order to try and get a no contact order. I mean the same thing happened to me. Um, when I was put on supervised visitation, the supervisor cut off the contact because I sent my daughter an emoji, uh, you know, one of those little emoticons on, on Skype. And she said, oh, that's inappropriate. And as a result, I didn't see my daughter for 18 months. I didn't even have a sign of life, right? And um, so one of the other things that you could do in your situation is to file contempt against the father for every time that he not that he did not comply with the visitation order, um, have you done that? There is also the factor too that once he has got full custody of my children, uh, maybe it was about five to six months or so later after that, he moved my children outside of the county to another county with no court permission, and he would also have to notify me if he was to do that. He never did any of that. I asked my lawyer at that time to file contempt of court against them as that would be the protocol, never did it. That's another problem. Um, I feel like a lot of these lawyers kind of are like buddy-buddy with each other to an extent. They don't, they're afraid to go against the other lawyer, do what really needs to be done. You're paying them literally thousands of dollars for them to sit there and be like, oh, well, you know, I think that's not really a need. I'm like, well, then how is this guy going to ever get in trouble? If, you, if you're if you the one that's supposed to be fighting, not only for me, but for my children, and you're not going to even file contempt of court against something that is outright against the court order, this is it. This was in the court order. You're not. We're not allowed to move outside of Lutheran County. These what? lawyers are all in a uh, good old boy network. Um, and, and that is the deal. They go out and have drinks together, and uh, you know, on, on Friday nights, they decide the cases on the golf court. Um, they pretend that they're there to work for you, but these cases are already decided before you even go to court. And they all, they, this is a deal that they make. The, your case follows the exact script um, that I outlined in the beginning of the show before you entered the, the, the broadcasting room. When a child reports child abuse, whether it's to the mom or to the teacher or wherever, and it, get, it goes to CPS, um, the deal, the, the script un, uh, unfolds. The mother is, um, you know, labeled as mentally unstable uh, or a parental alienator, and the child is placed with the abusive father. Because now everyone can make money, right? At the, everyone's going to make money. For, for until your children are 18. Guardian ad litems, mediators, uh, psychologists, supervisors, attorneys. Um, I mean, it's a circus. This is an, a, a well-oiled machine, and the oil is trauma. And the mothers are traumatized, and the children are traumatized, and the men walk away with the kids. 
um, being able to molest them and create child pornography. I mean, this is one, one of the things that I often say, like, where do you think child pornography is coming from? Yeah. It's not created by strangers. Yeah. It's created by fathers who have full custody. And there are literally billions of images and videos floating around there on the Internet. And this is all created. Um, so it's a huge business. Um, that's what we're up against. Um, you know, so <clears throat> our, our situation is uh, dire, to say the least. And I want to share this video <clears throat> that I came across today, actually. Um, and I don't know if this is in the way here. Deconstructing America. Uh, there's two episodes of this YouTube video, and I highly recommend it because in it, you will see a whole bunch of attorneys who actually blew the whistle on exactly what's happening to you and to me and to the other two million protective mothers in the United States. <clears throat> and the total of 8, billion, uh, 8 million uh, protective mothers worldwide. And th so these attorneys um, in this video um, actually uh, talk about all of this and they try, they try to stop it. I mean, it's too much for me to, um, to play this video right now, but you, you can actually watch all these attorneys talk about um, the fact that they gotten judicially retaliated against for blowing the whistle. So these attorneys actually not only lost their employment, but they even got jailed for um, talking about cases like yours and like mine. So the ethical attorneys that are out there, because they are out there, uh, get retaliated against. Uh, the handful of wonderful attorneys in California that I know are all being retaliated against to discourage them from taking on our cases. And let's face it, we don't have a dime. So that is another, uh, you know, it's not, it's, they don't have a great incentive to, to take our cases. So if they do take our cases, it means their hearts are in the right place, but they get uh, retaliated against. So your best bet, actually, is to fight pro se. You know your case the best. You know it from beginning to end. And you are going to fight for your children like no attorney ever will. You know? And it's challenging because you have to learn the law while you're traumatized. But for me, what I have found out since I've started fighting pro se is that it is a way also to get rid of the, the post-traumatic stress disorder because you're actually constructi constructively fighting. You're actually doing something um, that, you know, has effect. So keep the, making the logs uh, of every time that your ex is violating that order and start with filing a contempt. Start with filing contempt like right now for all the times that he has violated the order. You need to flip the script on him. So where he has been vexatiously litigating against you, you you're going to do that and turn it around. Because if you, you're going to file contempt against him, I mean, it's, how is he going to defend himself against that? Well, his lawyer gets everything he wants. That's the problem. I mean, there's so many things that it's been brought up in court even though it wasn't filed. And it's like they just, the, there's nothing done about it. He recently removed my children. They relocated mm -hmm. to another area. And I'm not allowed to even have the address now of where my children are being kept. I'm, I'm, in, the same, I'm in the same boat. So this is what I did. Yeah, I, the way I look at it is like, look, these, these fathers don't know anything about the law. So they're hiding a, a behind these attorneys that know yeah. the law and that know the game. So they are like the generals of the army, so to speak, of opposing party. So what you need to go after the general, because he, there's this unethical attorney who is violating all the codes that they're supposed to stick with. Yeah. So you can start gathering material of all of the violations that the attorney has, um, you know, has done. Um, and I can show you here, <clears throat> I have it sitting right here behind me, um, just for kicks. This here, 
is the complaint that I filed against my ex's attorney. These are 452 pages of lies that I filed with the California State Bar, and they have launched an official investigation. And there's no way that this woman can defend herself against it, because these, these are all lies. So I, I would love to be a fly on the wall when this woman has to appear in front of the California State Bar and explain that. And so this is what we need to do. We need to go after these attorneys, and we need to go hold them accountable in front of their own employers, in front of their own constituents, in front of their own um, associations that reward them with all kinds of child welfare certifications and whatnot. We need to have these attorneys disbarred. If we massively do this, then an attorney is going to think twice about taking on a case like this, right? Yeah. So where as now, attorneys think twice about taking our cases on um, because they're going to get retaliated against. We need to flip the script on them. And the only way we can do it is by fighting pro se, by doing this. And I'm more than uh, willing to uh, help you to put something like this together, to do it right, because not all complaints um, get accepted. It's very hard, actually, to get them accepted. So you need to actually, you have to have the evidence of the false allegation, which is usually the motions that they've submitted, right? And you need to have all the evidence of the collusion, because collusion is, is unlawful. I mean, it's illegal. They're not allowed to to collude with supervisors and therapists. And, um, and the same goes for the judge. You can file a complaint against the judge as, as well. Um, you can file a complaint with the uh, Supreme Court Review Board and with the Federal um, Review Board, a Federal Court Review Board, and do the exact same thing. I mean, these individuals uh, have to f work along certain codes. And so as long as you, you know, have a record of all the evidence of what you're telling me now, you can go after them. And that's hard. I mean, it's hard to do because we are all traumatized and we miss our children and we, are, we feel terrible that we cannot protect them against uh, identified child molesters. I mean, it's incredibly challenging and I understand that. But this is, I believe, the only way to do it um, and continue to expose. What you're doing today, sharing your story on Hells for Children, is huge. I mean, it's incredibly important. Not only are you helping your own case with it, but you're helping millions of other mothers who are going through the exact same thing. And when they watch this show, they realize they're not, you know, the only ones, which is what we need. We need to bring out the awareness about all our cases, you know. So my suggestion would be is dump the attorney and start becoming a pro se expert. We need to help each other become good at that, <laughs> you know, which is a challenge. Either that or, find, or get an attorney that will um, lit seriously study out my case and not just, you know, you're just like a num another number and they do what they need to to get by. I find that with pretty much most attorneys. Every attorney I've had so far, I felt like they should have studied my case a lot more. They, there's a lot more facts they should have known. So much was missed in court that should have been said but on the attorney side. And then rarely does even allow me to even speak in court to where I can bring some of these things up. And when I do bring them up, the, attorney, the judge just looks at me like, okay, yeah, I don't care. Like that's I feel like that's the look that I get because all, all she cares about is what his lawyer wants. Whatever his lawyer wants every single time he gets. Whatever my, my lawyer brings up, it's like it doesn't even matter. Yeah, and that's exactly, um, you know, a video I just shared of that um, Judge Edelman. Let me go back to that. This man, I mean, he just, it, it's so um, revealing. Uh, <clears throat> 
really, if people want to find out, if, if they don't believe how this is going down, they should just watch um, the hour video of this judge because it, it says it all. Now, there's been, you shared that there's more um, mothers in Lucerne County dealing with this. Um, yeah. And I, I had you gave me another link. I think it's this one. Um, yeah, here's a, a mom who filed a federal lawsuit against um, CPS in Lucerne County. So this is the way to go. We need to, uh, you know, and and there's moms. When I suggest this, there's moms that say, well, you know, if I file an intentional tort or if I file a civil rights claim, then you know I'll probably lose. But you know what? This is not about winning. These people, we, it's a machine, and we need to become the clogs in the machine. You know, we need to make it expensive for them. Right? right now, they're making money, and we need to make sure that it's starting to cost them money. We might not win all the cases, but let's at least completely clog their system. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things we can do. Um, Another thing that we can do is, is massively go and demonstrate, just like what's happening today with the women's marches that are happening all around the world. Um, these particular marches right now are against Trump, but what if we just all go massively demonstrate uh, about our stolen kids and demand them back, you know? Um, I would really love the... Um, the unity that I've seen today on TV with with the women's marches, uh, and and see that for mothers like you and me and all the millions of mothers of judicially uh, trafficked children. Because what's more important than children? I can't think of anything. You know, I mean, we can we can have this global agenda about, you know, the global warming and, and yada, yada, yada. But let's say we have global warming resolved, but all our children are traumatized and molested and abused and their childhood's been ruined. Um, how is the next generation going to um, support that, uh, you know, that planet that's been resolved with global warming? So, I mean, really, we cannot only focus on um, one issue here. We, we must look at, and I'm trying to pull up a um, link here that I have about right here. The effects of... The, on the children. Domestic violence, developing brains, and the lifespan. Adverse childhood experiences um, lead to um, neurochemical changes in the brain. It seriously uh, creates brain changes. This is very disturbing. So all these attorneys and these judges that don't give a damn about our kids, I'll tell you something. Our children are the ones taking care of these people when they're in, you know, their retirement homes, and they're going to be screwed up from all the trauma that's been inflicted on them. This the next generation is going to have to somehow take care of this planet. And good luck, because the, the next generation is completely damaged. Um, I was watching a, um, I was watching TV yesterday, and the child ombudswoman of the Netherlands came on TV, and she said that 25 percent of all divorce cases deal with these issues. Now, if we know that 50% of all marriages end in divorce, then we're talking about a quarter um, of all of that. That's millions and millions and millions of children dealing with this. It is a $3 trillion industry. And for the folks that um, want more information and want to see the research that backs up what I'm saying, feel free to go to my page here and to the reflection button. Um, all the research is on here. Um, and everything here that I'm saying on this page is backed up with research. And um, we are dealing with a holocaust. I, I don't have any other words for it. We're dealing with a holocaust. 
Um, this, you know, and what you and I are going through is just one part of, of the puzzle, right? I mean, the other part of it is the, the CPS removing children, placing them in foster care. And like you said, the kinship foster care placement, but also the other type of foster care placement and the financial incentives that are made with that. Um, you know, one out of every 25 kids in the United States is placed in foster care. In the Netherlands, that, is even, that amounts even higher. This is happening all over the globe. Now that's, and there's more to, to, to the puzzle, um, because there are two million children a year who disappear. They disappear. I mean, and, and these are not numbers that I'm making up. You can just go to the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, go online, look at their statistics, and tally it up. So, 2 million children a year makes for 20 million children per decade. I would like to know where these kids go. I mean, they don't just evaporate, right? So, if we have all these abused children, <laughs> all these disappearing children, all these kids placed in foster care, what can we say that, you know, it's like an anomaly if you are able to raise a child <laughs> who's not abused in this world at this point? Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm going to suggest to my daughter that she'll ever put a child on this planet after what I've seen, you know, it's a dangerous place at this point for any mother and child. And, um, you know, this goes way beyond only a patriarchal issue. It is about sociopathy, it's about pedophilia, it's about control, it's about money. Um, we're in a really, we're in deep shit. We're in really serious deep shit. And I don't know if any politician can turn it around. I know some mothers have faith in Donald Trump. Um, I don't see how he's going to turn an $800 billion a year industry around. Well, not only that, I think I see some things that he's looking to defund and maybe even shut down children and youth agencies. I've been looking into the researching into that. But how is he going to get the children back with the mothers that have already been stolen from the mothers? You know, there are mothers who have abused their children and should not have their children. There are those out there, but there are many of us out there that were protecting our children and our children were literally taking them from us for protecting our children. And how are we going to get our children back? How are we ever yeah. going to get them out of the abusive home that they're stuck in? It's a great point. Um, you know, one thing, it's one thing to prevent this issue from happening in future generations, but what about the two million moms in the United States like you and me? And I'll share my last link here before we have to call it quits because we're running up to the end of the show. For folks who want to look at our cases, um, I created a um, database here, and it's you know work in progress. It's called Mommy Side, and all these links on here of these mothers are take you will take you to petitions and YouTube videos and websites of mothers just like Becca, just like me who are going through the same thing, and all our cases are the same. It's, it's following a script. What about these mothers? You know, I hope that President Trump will look at this and think of a solution. Um, one of the things I can think of is like all our cases need to be redone, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've said from a long time ago, if my case was done in front of a jury and they would have seen the, all of the evidence that there is, I can't imagine that it would ever went this way. One of our biggest issues in the family courts is they give you a judge with nobody to keep that judge on track. Whatever that judge decides is it. She doesn't have a jury there to say, we believe this is what should be done. 
there needs to be a jury for family court cases that have anything to, in, in mind to do with one parent or the other to be abusive, then there should be a jury. Absolutely. And these judges, uh, we need to get rid of judicial immunity. Um, that is really important as well. On my reflection page, I have several solutions that I offer here. If you scroll down, um, and again, you know, these are just my thoughts. Uh, I'm always open to hear more ideas and more solutions. Um, one of the things I'm suggesting, just like you, is to have jury trials and to have, um, you know, uh, custody insurance to make sure that each party is equally represented financially in court and um, that everyone's trained in recognizing domestic violence um, all the way up from school teachers um, to um, folks that are on the jury and, and any judges. Uh, maternal deprivation, pedophilia, child abuse, these cases need to be handled in criminal courts. Your ex needs to be behind bars, so does mine. And at this point, the attorneys that have assisted him and the judges need to be behind bars too. We need human rights tribunals to look at all of these cases, to open all these cases in court, um, just like what happened after World War II. Um, that's what we're in. Mommy side is a similar holocaust as to what happened in World War II. You are extremely brave and courageous for sharing this devastating, horrific story with the world. Without your testimony, we can't create this change. I'm hoping that at some point when we have 100 YouTube links to present it to the president and say, what are you going to do for us? You know? So without you, moms like you coming out, we can't make that change happen. So I want to thank you so much for coming out today, sharing so courageously this difficult story. Now you have this YouTube video. It will be up in about two days. You can share it, try to get help. Um, but again, I think your best bet is to start fighting pro se. We're in for a long haul. This is going to take many years anyway. So we might as well do it ourselves. And my you know, request for all the protective mothers who are watching, who are in Lucerne County and who have uh, experience going after these types of Nazi social workers, please contact Becca and help her file a civil rights claim um, against these particular individuals. Let's go after them. And let's go after the father with contempt proceedings and get him in jail, <laughs> you know, get your kids back. And I hope that this interview contributes to the reunification of you and your children. So thank you for being on, Becca. You're welcome. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for watching another episode of Hells for Children, and I hope you join me again next week. Bye-bye, everybody.